Welcome back to Everyday Physics, topic one, on how a street lamp works. In this video, we're going to be looking at current flow and at Ohm's law. In the last video, we were considering static charges. In this video, we're going to start considering what happens when the charges start moving. Moving charges are called an electric current. In metal wires, it's the electrons that move conducting the current as the electrons are only loosely bound to the atom. Often we refer to metals as a sea of electrons because these electrons are very free to move within the metal. Let's have a look at this diagram in a bit more detail. The electrons are moving to the right. That is physically what is happening inside this wire. Now historically it was not realised that it was the electrons that moved. Historically people thought that we had moving positive charges. So it was thought that a current rather than being the flow of the electrons to the right of the screen in this case was actually the flow of positive charges to the left of the screen. So we say that conventional current or current what people just call current in general usage, is actually moving in the opposite direction to the flow of the electrons. So the current in this wire is actually moving to the left. To calculate current, we use the formula current is equal to charge on time. We have some funny letters that we use to write this equation. Current is given the letter I, charge is given the letter Q and time is T. So the formula that we use to calculate the amount of current is written I is equal to Q over T. Let's have a look at an example using this equation. Assume that 5.0 times 10 to the 21 electrons pass through a wire in half a minute. And the question is, what current flows through the wire? So here's our wire and we've got our electrons moving through that wire. So we have the formula I is equal to Q on T where Q is the charge and T is the time. So Q is equal to the number of electrons which is 5.0 times 10 to the 21 times the charge on each of those electrons. So each electron has a charge of 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19. Now I'm leaving the negative sign off because it doesn't matter. That will determine which direction the current's flowing, not the size of the current. Okay, so we've got our total charge, which is given by, when we solve that on the calculator, typing it in, 5.0 EXP21, times 1.602 exp minus 19, we get 801 coulombs. And now our time, we're told that this is half a minute. We always substitute time in seconds into these equations. So the time is given by 30 seconds. So now we can just substitute these into our equation for current. So current is given by I is equal to 801 over 30. And solving that on the calculator, we get 26.7 amps. And then because this is given to two significant figures, we've got five and a zero, so that's two numbers. We should give this to two significant figures. So it's equal to 27 amps. And that's to two significant figures. So that's how we would solve a question like that. Currents flow along wires. Wires are often covered in an insulator, like this wire is covered in rubber, to stop the electrons escaping. Let's have a look at how we can set up a simple circuit. To start the simple circuit, we need a power supply. 
This power supply provides the electrons that will flow around the circuit. To construct a circuit, we need to construct a loop around which the current can flow. If there's any holes in the loop, then it's like having a big dam in the river. It stops the water or the electrons flowing past that point, so we won't get an electric current. So to, to set up a simple circuit with a light bulb, we start with our power supply. We can then pl plug it into the light bulb. Now to continue our loop, let's plug it into this component, which is a switch. So we'll go from the light globe into the switch. And then this component here is called a rheostat, and it acts as a resistance. When current flows through this coil down here, it experiences resistance. If it has to flow through more of the coil, it experiences more resistance. So we can change the resistance of the rheostat by moving this knob along here. The current flows in at the bottom of this coil, goes through the coil and then up along here, and then we'll connect it back to the power supply here. We can show this setup schematically like this. This symbol here represents the light globe. This symbol is the switch. Here's our variable resistor and here's our power supply. Let's turn the power supply on now and see what happens. We'll just need to close the switch which will complete the loop allowing our current to flow. And you can see once the current flows the light globe lights up. Now let's have a look at the current quantitatively. To measure the current we use an ammeter. So current is measured in amps and to get the flow of current we need to put the ammeter in the circuit so that all the current flows through the ammeter. The ammeter will then tell us how much current is flowing. So in this case we can plug the ammeter in this way. Let's add the ammeter now to our schematic diagram. The ammeter is shown as a little A with a circle drawn around it as you can see here. So currently the current is reading as 3.3 milliamps. And you can see if we change the resistance, as the resistance increases, the light becomes dimmer and the current's now gone down to 2.5 milliamps. So there's less current flowing through the circuit. Now the other thing that we can measure in the electric circuit is called voltage. Voltage is related to the amount of potential energy which is available to push the electrons through the circuit. So let's measure the voltage of the, across this light globe here. Each component in the circuit will use up some of that potential energy. So as the current flows through each component, there will be a voltage drop across that component. So let's measure the voltage drop across our light globe here. So the voltage drop across this light globe we're told is 4.8 volts. So volts is the units for voltage. When we plug a voltmeter into a circuit, we always plug it in in what's called parallel. We'll look more at series and parallel in a later video. But basically what it means is you put one wire from the voltmeter on one side of the component and the other wire from the voltmeter on the other side of the component. Okay, what we're going to do is a little experiment now. We're going to change the resistance using the rheostat and we're going to record how the current and the voltage changes. The current flows through this light globe because we've got the same current flowing everywhere. It's flowing around in the loop and we're measuring the voltage drop across the light globe. 
what we'll do is we'll plot a graph as we go so that we can hopefully get some idea about how these quantities are related. So now that the current is 2.5 milliamps, the voltage is given as 4.8 volts. So we've got a slightly higher current now, slightly brighter lamp. So the current is 2.8 milliamps and the voltage drop across the globe has gone up to 5.8 volts. We've now got a current of 3.2 milliamps and the voltage drop across the light globe is 7.3 volts. Current of 3.6 milliamps and a voltage drop of 9.4 volts. And finally, at our limit, we've got 4 milliamps and a voltage drop which has gone off the scale, but we can We can assume that this voltage drop is somewhere between 10 and 12 volts as our power supply is only putting out 12 volts. Let's have a look at this graph in a little bit more detail. As you can see, we can fit a straight line through the points V and I, the voltage and the current. This tells us that there is a linear relationship between these two quantities. So we know that voltage over the current is equal to the gradient and that this is some constant number. Let's start by working out what this gradient actually is numerically and then we can talk about what it corresponds to physically. So to work out a gradient you may remember from maths that a gradient is the rise over the run. So we need to find out how high this goes. Let's, let's choose 10 volts. Let's draw a line from 10 across to our graph and we'll draw a line from 5 across to our graph. So the height here, the rise, is equal to 5 because it's 10 minus the 5. And now let's look at the run here. We drop a line vertically down there and a line vertically down here. We have that our run is around about, what's this, 3.8 and this point here would be around about 2.5 and so solving that on our calculator gives us around about 3.8 and this was in milliamps and this was in volts, so volts per milliamp. Now Ohm noticed this linear relationship and he realized that this number is actually the resistance of the component that you're measuring. So in this case the resistance of our light globe was equal to 3800 ohms. Now this factor of a thousand comes because here I'm dividing by milliamps. So if we wanted to get this into ohms, which is the unit for resistance, we'd do, be doing 5 divided by 3.8 minus 2.5 over 1,000, where this is in volts and this is in amps. And when we do that, when we divide on the bottom, it's the same as timesing on the top. So we need to times this number by 1,000 to convert it into ohms. So the resistance here is 3,800 ohms. Okay, so the relationship that we've just seen between V and I, the voltage and the current, is called Ohm's law. And we can use Ohm's law to calculate the voltage, the current, or the resistance of a circuit or a component in a circuit when we have information about the other quantities. So if we know the voltage and the current, we can calculate the resistance. Let's have a look at an example now where we can solve a problem using Ohm's law. Let's look at a problem that we could solve using Ohm's law. Imagine that we were told that we had a circuit with a 12 volt power supply. This was connected to a resistor and through an ammeter. We're told that the resistance of the resistor 
is equal to 20 ohms. And we're asked, what is the reading on the ammeter? So it's asking us how much current is flowing through the circuit. One thing to note is that there's two common ways of drawing resistors. We can draw a little square box like this, or we can draw a zigzag line like this. These both represent resistors. If we put an arrow through it, it means that it's a variable resistor, so we can change the resistance of that resistor. But let's get back to the question. What is the amount of current flowing through this circuit? We can use Ohm's law. V is equal to I R. And so rearranging it to find the current, we know that the current I is equal to V over R. Now the voltage drop across the resistor is 12 volts. The resistance of the resistor is 20 ohms. So now we can solve this on our calculator. 12 divided by 20 gives us 0 0.60 amps. And so this ammeter is going to pick up a current of 0 0.60 amps. Okay, let's have a look at one other phenomenon now. What we're going to do now is we're going to put this piece of paper into the circuit. Now, paper is a non-conductor. It holds onto its electrons very tightly. So it's hard for a current to flow through paper. So what do you think is going to happen when we connect the paper into the circuit? Okay, so as you can see, the light's gone out. This is a large section of a non-conductor, so there's no way for the electrons to flow through this piece of paper. And so there's no current flowing around this circuit now. This acts like a big dam, which is stopping that flow of current. So in this video, we've seen that electric current can flow along a wire. This flow of electric current is commonly called electricity. We've seen that electric current is actually made up of electrons flowing along the wire, but by convention, by definition, we say that the electric current flows in the opposite direction to the electrons. Now, it's the electric current flowing to the street lights which actually gives them the energy so that they can shine and produce light. We're going to look at that in more detail in future videos. In the next video, we're going to look a bit more at electric circuits. We'll be considering series and parallel electric circuits. I'd like to give special thanks to Jonathan Horner for his input into this video and for filming it.